It's good to be with you today. Things are starting to brew. Things are starting to, like it's almost here, right? That's the beauty of uh, it, it being Christmas, of course. Uh, that's the beauty of the Advent season, this four weeks that we go through where we prep, where we get ready for Christmas. The beauty of it is the anticipation begins to build and you start feeling it. And so I'm, I trust you're feeling it in the air uh, in whatever way uh, and in your home, in whatever way, in whatever way that, that works for you. Uh, well, all of our Tuesday evening, the gatherings are, are now done. This past Tuesday, we had our, our, our Christmas uh, party. It was kind of a kids-themed party. We watched, we watched uh, Peanuts or the Charlie Brown Christmas. And uh, my, that, that ugly beard that I was growing, that served a purpose at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, the, end of the night. And then candy was, can, uh, candy was handed out. And I went home and I shaved that thing immediately. It was bugging me to death. So, uh, the, 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 anyway. anyway, so that's all done. We, we, did our, we did our tamalada and our, our decorating service and our Christmas uh, kids party. And we did our Thanksgiving um, potluck dinner. And so that's all done. Except we have one more uh, non-Tuesday non event, but one more event coming. And that is our Christmas Eve service. And this is really... Uh, one of two high water marks for us uh, as a church during the year. The other, the other being Easter. Uh, but our Christmas Eve service, we have friends and family that don't normally normally go to church, uh, come and join us, and it's a festive night, a, a fun night. And this is going to be our best Christmas Eve service yet. It starts at what time does it start? Six thirty. It's going to be uh, the, the beginning, the 6.30 start, though, is not the actual singing and playing. The, the 6.30 start is actually where we begin with refreshments, and we have a kids' station, and we're going to have a photo booth, and we're going to have, and this is maybe the thing I'm most excited about, we're going to have a live nativity. But it's not going to be in here where, like, the noise and the bustle sort of distracts from it. It's going to be tucked away. You're going to go into another room, and there's going to be a live nativity. It's going to be well done. I was just getting some more of the details about it just a few minutes ago. So, so you'll come in, get some refreshments, take a photo. Kids can go have fun at the kids' booth. And then you're going to want to go in and see, with your refreshments, go in and see the live nativity. And then we'll come back in here, and we'll start the service. The service, like every year, it's the reading of the Christmas story and the singing of the Christmas songs, back and forth. We'll be out of here by 8 p.m. at the latest. Um, they're, 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 it's going to take a small um, army of volunteers to put this together. We, there's so many different stations and so many different things going on. We already have all the volunteers. Many of you in this room are a part of that. I just want you to know that tomorrow an email is going to go out to all of you. I've talked to each one of you individually, but you're going to get an email so that you kind of get the whole picture. Like, what else is happening? And, and it'll lay out the whole evening. If you're a reader, uh, you'll get this. If you're a musician, if you're playing Mary or Joseph, if you're part of the kids' booth, you'll get an email from me tomorrow that will lay out all the details. And when you, It's going to be a big deal. One thing that I need help with, um, the, um, our ladies' Bible study is overseeing refreshments, but... We need for you to bring uh, cookies or whatever you want to bring in, in the form of, well, not whatever you want to bring, but, but something that makes sense given that this is our uh, Christmas Eve uh, church service. Uh, bring that. Uh, cookies would be the best thing, and, um, and that'll be helpful. Two things that I need for you to do. One is put that on your connection card, and then second, you can go and see Priscilla and let her know that you're gonna, what you're going to bring. Uh, but if you would bring cookies, that would be, that'd be awesome. And with as many cookies as you bring, that's how many cookies, cookies we're going to have. We're not going to supplement that. We're just going to rely on you. And I'll, I'll, you, you'll, you'll get that in an email as well. So that's what's going on. Um, and then um, a decision that we made, I think it was a really good decision, but a, a decision had to be made. Do we bring you here for a really well-developed Christmas Eve service and send you home and ask you to come back 10, hour, 10 hours later for another service? And so what, what we decided is we're, we're not going to do that. You already know that if you've been here. We, uh, we're putting all of our eggs in this Christmas Eve basket. It's going to be our big, our big Christmas service, uh, Christmas Eve, Saturday night. And then you go home, 
and enjoy your home Christmas morning, enjoy your friends, enjoy your family, whoever you're going to be with. This week I am writing a Christmas devotion that I'm going to send to you so that you can use that on Sunday morning in your home to worship by yourself or to worship with your friends or to worship with your family, whoever is in your home on that Christmas morning. So Saturday night here, 6.30, uh, be done by 8. It can be a big deal. Uh, and then Sunday morning you stay home and worship together as a family. I think those are all the details. I don't think I've forgotten anything. I'm sure I forgot something, but I think I got all the high points, all the, all the important stuff. So that's what's going on, and I look forward to seeing you there. Let's stand now, and if you would just say hi to somebody next to you. Maybe you see a new face, somebody you don't recognize. <laughs> Including Judah. Judah's here, the, the, straight from the Navy. Good to see you. All right, if you would take your seat and let's pray together. God, we are here to today um, not out of obligation. I mean, maybe a, maybe a few of us, but, but, but for the most part, those of us that are here today, we're not here because we have to be here. We're obligated to be here. We feel guilty if we don't. We're here because we want to be here. We're here, we're here because we believe that you, God, um, you have um, what no one else has. You offer us what no one else offers. You Being here is, is life-giving. And so we, uh, we're not just here running through the, emotion, uh, through, the, through the motions, God. We're here because we, we want to experience you. We want to hear your voice, we want to be healed by you. We, we really do believe that, that you, um, are the, you, are, you are the source of all that we need. We really believe that. And so we're, we're gathered here today anticipating that, that you have something for us this morning. It may be hard, but it's going to be good. And so we... Um, we just ask this morning that you would quiet the noise that we've brought, the, the emotional noise that we've brought with us, and the mental noise that we've brought, and just the, uh, the noise of, of community and culture that we've brought with us, not, not, not necessarily bad stuff, but just all the noise. Would you quiet that in our lives? And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here, you here now. We want to hear from you. We want to be changed by you. God, we want to hear from you, not from Pastor Randy. We want to hear from you, God. So if you would speak through me in a prophetic, in a prophetic way, if you would speak through me, God, uh, and we will, we will celebrate that. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So for me, and for you as well, uh, I, I trust, because we're all busy people, for me it's been a really, really, really busy fall. And some of the things, some of the reasons it's been busy you know about, and other things just, you know, a lot, lot going on in my life. Some things that maybe you don't even know, just busyness. Good work, school, play, family, but I have been really busy. So this week, this past week, I finally was able to slow down a little bit. And in the afternoons, I had a little bit of space to just, catch up and, 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 and look forward to 2023. And I also, uh, yesterday, uh, I got to, to go out with my two youngest sons and climb into the duck blind, uh, cold. It had stopped raining by the time we got there, but we, 
we had a good, we had a really good time, just me and my two youngest boys, my two youngest kids. And um, <clears throat> yesterday afternoon, um, I, I, I noticed something that you've probably noticed as well. And as an outdoorsman, it, it, it's, it's, it's already, I've been aware of this, but I noticed it once again yesterday, and that is how short the days are getting, right? And, 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 and we look at each other in the duck blind, and we're like, wow, the sun is setting so early these days. I'm sure you experience that. I'm sure you feel that. And, and it's intriguing to me that every December, I'm surprised by that. I mean, you'd think I would know that. It's been true all of my life, and I've lived most of my life here in South Texas. And so the sun always, you know, it's doing the same thing year after year, yet it always surprises me how dark it gets, or how early it gets dark this time of year. In fact, the shortest, the shortest day of the year, I believe, is Wednesday. I believe they call that the winter solstice. And so it's, it's, it's weird, but it, moving into January and February, it will get colder, but the days will actually start getting longer, um, at least the, the days of sunlight. So Wednesday is the actual darkest, shortest day of the year. And the darkness has an impact on us, doesn't it? I mean, I'll go first. I'll admit that the darkness has an impact on us emotionally. Tonight begins Hanukkah. The Jewish families will be lighting their menorahs and celebrating Hanukkah for the next eight days. Darkness lit up by candles. My son Truett, who's going to be arriving in five minutes at the uh, Harlingen Airport, uh, that's where Lydia is, she's picking him up. My son Truett lives in Alaska, most of you know that. And uh, right now, this time of year, where he lives, they have six hours of daylight. And that's actually a lot for, for Alaska. Um, in, in, in Dillingham, where he lives, the sun comes up at 10.30 a.m., and then it sets at 4.30 p.m. But in some parts of Alaska this time of year, there is merely a bit of twilight, and then it goes away and it gets dark again. In Nome, Alaska, uh, in, 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 in parts of Alaska north of Fairbanks, it doesn't even get light for a minute. A little bit of a little bit of a of twilight, and then it goes away, and it's dark again, for day after day, after day. And this darkness, it has an impact on us. That's my point. But there, there's a there, there's a sense that that darkness brings for us. I mean, I don't know. You the, tell me if this is true of you. It is certainly true of me that this darkness brings a sense of 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 waiting. A sense of wanting, a sense of melancholy, like a little light, light depression or sadness. I mean, even if you're like me, and I'm the guy that, like I say, I love darkness. Um, I enjoy, for instance, worshiping at night more than worshiping um, during the daylight. Um, the first church plant that I was a part of, uh, in, in, in Albuquerque, for a number of years, we only had Friday night worship down on the strip or down in the, in the university district. And so we were in a theater and we had worship on Friday nights rather than Sunday mornings. And I just really loved the vibe of worshiping at night. So I say I love darkness, and yet still it has an emotional toll. The Bible, you know this, the Bible uses darkness as a metaphor regarding humanity's sadness, humanity's lostness, humanity's brokenness. Because an ethic of Christianity is that we are all broken. 
Not, not just those who seem more broken or who look more broken, who, who wear their brokenness on, their outs, on, on the outside. But Christian ethic is that every one of us, because we're born into this world and because this world is broken and because there is so much sadness, it's just in our, our DNA. And so we're, we're all born broken. And, and Christ... The, the, the light of the world, Christmas Jesus, he came to earth precisely because of this, this brokenness. And, and so into the darkness, the Bible tells us, a light shines. And that light, the light of the world, is Jesus. I'm going to ask you some questions today that I don't, of course, expect you to answer out loud. They're, they're rather personal questions, but they're questions for you to ponder. And, and, what, and the first one is this. Are you, are you feeling down? I, mean, I know it's Christmas and there's lights everywhere, but are you feeling down like, like darkness is resting on you today? The teaching of the Bible, the teachings of Jesus... Tell us that the answer to darkness is light. But actually, even if you don't embrace the Bible, even if you, just on a practical standpoint, I think you would say, well, yeah, the, the, the answer to darkness always has been light. The antithesis of darkness is light. So this waiting and this wanting... And the sadness, I don't want to make any assumptions, but the sadness that perhaps is in your life is, is represented by emotional darkness, even nighttime in the Bible. I mean, when we think on Mary and Joseph waiting on the birth of Jesus, like, if you in your mind's eye picture what this, what this uh, manger scene that we're going to have, the live nativity, if you in your mind's eye picture what it's going to be like on Saturday night, if I just ask you to close your eyes and picture, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that you would picture the birth of Jesus as a nighttime event. We just do that. I don't, know, I don't even know why. We do that, except that this, this waiting and this wanting seems to go well with, with darkness, with nighttime. And there's this, this intuitive expectation that, that, yes, the night was dark, and into that darkness came the light of the world, the baby Jesus. I don't think that's me. Somebody's getting a call. Just, we'll, we'll let it go to voicemail. Um, I'm going to have to like, wait for that to stop ringing. So just, uh... Hopefully it's not the, that kind of person that calls back. You know that guy? The insistent person who calls twice? Okay, it's not. Um, so back to our story. Um, as I said, on Tuesday night we watched Charlie Brown Christmas here on this screen. And, and I, I watched it carefully, and I thought about this fact. The Charlie Brown Christmas special, almost, if not every scene in that movie, takes place at night. Why is that? I, I believe it's the same reason we innately, intuitively, we have this sense of Christmas is about the darkness, the sadness of humanity, and Christ, the light of the world, entering in, penetrating that darkness. There's a darkness which Christ seeks to enter. The light of Christ is set to enter your life. 
in a place, in a way, such that your darkness, the darkness of your life, will not be able to comprehend it. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 5, says this, The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, you see that? What does that tell you? That tells you that this is talking about Jesus coming in, initially is coming in as the baby, as the Messiah, as the Christ child, coming in. This is chapter 1 of John, and it says the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That is the story of Christmas. Your darkness, my, my darkness, the darkness the emotional darkness of our lives. It's a, it's a slow grind, a slow fade, a, a stumbling, sort of a discontentedness. I'm just trying to kind of awaken the emotions in you that maybe this does live in your heart right now. That, 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 discont- that disheartened sort of, of waiting and, and, and wanting. There are promises throughout the Bible as to how God made a plan, the birth of Jesus, to deal with that wanting, that waiting, that darkness, that emotional darkness. An Old Testament promise repeated in the New Testament. The Old Testament is Isaiah 9, this great prophetic passage written um, about 700 years, 750 years before Jesus was ever born. And it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned, the light of the world, Jesus. And then in the book of of Matthew, where we've spent the last seven weeks as a church studying, in the book of Matthew, the writer of Matthew decides to to copy or or to, to quote that Old Testament prophetic promise, slightly different wording, but it says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Into darkness, a light will shine. That's the promise that God made for hundreds of years before he ever sent the Christ child. Now, we often ask, maybe you ask this this year, we often ask this question. What's with all the, the waiting at Christmas? Like, the, like we're waiting for Jesus to be born again. I mean, come on. He's already been born. I mean, if you're, if you're innately kind of a skeptic like I am, then you probably, you walk into a room and you're like, what's wrong with this situation? And maybe you do that. You're like, why do we keep, why do we keep acting like Jesus is going to be born on December 25th? He's, he already was born. Maybe ask that question. It's a, it's a valid skeptic sort of a question. It, the light of the world has already moved into the neighborhood. But let me ask you this. Into your darkness... Has he moved in there? Has Jesus infiltrated your skepticism, your confusion, your discontentment? There's a darkness in the human spirit, and light is the antidote. Like a light therapy lamp. You ever heard of these? I mean, most of us, because we live down here, we've got plenty of sunlight. But if you have people that live up north, or if you ever lived up north, they call it affectionately, they call it a, a happy lamp. Have you ever heard of that? A happy lamp. Some of us, some of us, we have family members that own them. We have friends that own them. You may own one. But a happy lamp, if you live in places where there's a lot of darkness, especially in the winter, it's a lamp that emits some kind of light. And it sounds crazy, but it really does work. Some kind of light that simulates uh, sunshine, and it actually has an emotionally sort of an awakening, awakening sort of uh, effect on you. And you can laugh like you don't think that works, but I'm telling you, like legit people in my life that really they're not they're not weird. They, they use them, and they actually in in dark climates these happy lamps work. Like a, like on a dark winter night in Alaska. I haven't convinced Truett to buy one yet, but. I'm thinking about maybe getting them one for Christmas because they really do work. Look, if, if life is, is dark for you now, 
then I, I, I do encourage you, uh, take mental health seriously. Maybe, maybe some, some, some good, good therapist sessions would, would, be, would be helpful, and I, I wouldn't discount that at all. Maybe a, a medical checkup is in order. Just make sure everything's good with you physically and medically. But I also, and this is, this is, this is my wheelhouse, this is where I reside, I also want to encourage you, realize that Jesus is ultimately the answer to our deep-seated darkness. And you can continue to stumble in the dark, or we can walk together in the light. All right, let's, let's drill down deep on what Jesus said. John chapter 8, <clears throat> Jesus says this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus makes this promise. I'm the light of the world. You follow me, you will no longer walk in darkness. You will, from here on out, walk in light. Now, back to uh, my introduction uh, about the, the, the shortness of days. Not only it makes sense, not only does the sun set earlier here in South Texas, it also rises later, right? And so uh, December is short on both sides of the day. So I enjoy, like many of you, I enjoy, uh, even when I'm not fishing, I enjoy getting up early um, turning on the Christmas lights this time of year, sitting in the glow of neon Christmas uh, with a cup of coffee and reflecting on life. Lydia gets up early too, but I try and beat her up, and I used to be way, way more able to do that. Uh, but I would sit in, the, sit in the darkness and just reflect on life, especially this time of year. And, and I'll say it this way, I do what I call a cost benefit analysis from a spiritual standpoint. What does it cost me to be a Christ follower? And what are the benefits of being a Christ follower? And so this Tuesday, just, just, this, just four or five days ago, um, I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I, kind of the mental process that I went through, maybe it'll be helpful to you. I was reflecting on this very verse. I knew I was going to be preaching on it. And I reflected on this very verse, John 8, 12. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I was reflecting on Jesus' words. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I had some questions. I mean, you've got questions. Like when we read a big promise like that, the promise that Jesus makes, we sometimes wonder like, well, why isn't this working in my life right now? Maybe you have a question like that. Or, you're like, or, or, or we say like, okay, I'll follow you, Jesus, but for how long? Or, or, or how much longer is this going to have to, you know, until this plays out? Or, or like, I had some questions. And so the, some of the questions were this, like, who will have the light of life? Okay, those who follow Jesus, it says. And then I had the question, well, who are those who follow Jesus? Because I want to be, I want to be that. I want to be a follower. And so what does it even mean to follow Jesus? Because if you're like me, sometimes I think like we we say, like we refer to ourselves, like I, I, I'm a Christ follower. I follow Jesus. But then what gives me the right to say that? I mean, on what grounds am I really a Christ follower? It's not nebulous. I want to encourage you to, to believe that. It's not nebulous. But it's good for me every once in a while to do a cost-benefit analysis and say, am I, am I following? What does it cost to me? And, and what are the benefits of following Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? So I'm going to try to answer that question. Now, for some clarity, we need to go back to a previous teaching, previous in the book of John, a previous teaching of Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? This is the big question, and I'm just going to warn you, it gets really intense here, okay? 
What does it mean to follow Jesus? When Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, and if you follow me, you will never walk in darkness, that is sort of, uh, that is dependent on the fact that he already told them what it means to follow him. He told them two chapters back. I mean, he wasn't thinking in chapters, but, but he, two chapters ago, he already told them. And now he says, if you do what I said two chapters ago, if you follow me, I already defined what following me is. If you follow me, you will walk in light. You will no longer walk in the darkness. Let's see what he said about what it means to follow him. Again, this gets intense. John chapter 6, verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Okay, that's super, that's super confusing, right? That's super confusing. I mean, unless you just want to make it, just tritely make it, oh, it's just about communion. Just come have the bread and then the, 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 the Welch's grape juice and you're good. Like, we could make it that. I mean, certainly he's alluding to that, but he's talking about so much more than that. And it's confusing. He says, only those who eat the flesh of Christ... And only those who drink his blood will have life. And only those who have life will be raised to eternal life on the last day. So important. Let me say that again. Jesus just said, only those who eat my flesh and only those who drink my blood will have life. And only those who have life will be raised to eternal life on the last day. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna figure out what this means. Let's go on for now. Verse 55 now. Jesus says, For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Okay. Just as challenging, just as hard. Verse, skip a few verses, let's go to verse 60. You're going to relate to this, I sure do. Verse 60. Many among his disciples heard this and said, this is a tough teaching. Too tough to swallow. <laughs> a little play on words there. Verse 61. Verse 61. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this and said, does this throw you completely? Skipping just for the sake of time today, skipping a few more verses to verse 66. Sort of tie a bow on this part. It says, from this time, from this time on, from this time, Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed Jesus. And, and let's be real clear. I've left out a few verses, but it's saying, because of what Jesus just said, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, I'm going to assume that you, like me, you feel the same response in you right now that, that the disciples felt. Like, this is too hard. This was too much for many of his disciples, and they just walked. Now, you should know this. Just a few days prior to Jesus making that statement, the disciples had watched Jesus feed 5,000 people miraculously, I mean, if you believe the Bible, which I do, with a few, just a few rudimentary sort of food items, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. That had just happened days earlier. 
And, and all these, this massive, this, the massive disciples that followed Jesus, like they could get behind that. And we could too. A, a benevolent Jesus. A benevolent Jesus who fills our belly and gives us good things to eat, a sort of Santa Claus like Jesus, they could get behind that. And Jesus is benevolent. And Jesus did. Everywhere Jesus went. I love, to, I love saying this about Jesus because we don't, we don't give Jesus enough cred in this, in, this, in this realm. It is true. Everywhere Jesus went, he would heal the sick. He couldn't stand to see people that were sick. He would just heal them. No, no expectation of, of anything in return. He would just heal them. Not only that, Jesus was, was like a mom. Jesus was like, like my wife, Lydia. He couldn't stand to see people who were hungry. Like there would be like crowds and they, would, they could tell like they were going to be hungry. And, and, and the disciples would be like, just let them, they can stop at Circle K on the way home. And he's like, no, we've got to feed them now. Find what you can, we're going to feed these people. So why my point is, Jesus is benevolent. He does care about your hunger. He does care about your sickness to the degree that he entered into the brokenness of humanity and he dealt with it. I'm not saying that Jesus is not a benevolent God. What I am saying is that those who came to him at that point in his ministry, merely because he would keep their bellies full, now his teaching is becoming too difficult. And so they walk. He invites, them to, he invites them to feed on his flesh. And they say, whoa, that is too much. Now, now, why did they walk? Why was that too much? Was it, was it because what he said was gross and macabre? And, uh, and you know, maybe, maybe like, man, this guy is weird. <laughs> like, this is weird. Like, he's asking us to eat him and drink his blood, some vampire. Like, this is weird. I'm out of here. Like, you know, it's like a Marilyn Manson music video or something. Um, that, that really dates me. That's a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> Billy laughs. That's, that's, his, that's his era. Uh, um, yeah, I could come up with a better, better uh, I won't. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's possible. It's possible that they left because he was just gross. Because they thought that was gross. But I don't think so. I think they left because they understood Jesus' metaphors. And they knew that this was a metaphor that was calling them to way more devotion than they were willing to give. I think at that point, they began to understand just how much Jesus was asking of them. Eat my flesh. What does, that, what does that mean? I mean, it sounds like an insult, but the, the old, the, let me just remind you, the Old Testament picture of manna in the wilderness, we think of it as something like bread that fell from heaven or it was like some kind of a coriander seed that would only last for the day. And you remember that story? If you don't, you can go look it up. But the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel, they, they weren't all that. Like, they were going to starve in the wilderness, but, but God would send them this manna, and they would collect it every day, and they would eat it, and it was God's provision. It was their only hope. Eat this and live. The nation would have starved without it. They were totally dependent. They had no other viable option. Understand, manna in the wilderness in the Old Testament is foreshadowing, or it's a foreshadowing of the coming of Messiah, the coming of Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 35. Now we're continuing to back up even a little bit more. You see, because when, when I say to you with no context, when I say Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're like, how violent. Like, because we don't have a context. But now, a little more of the story, let's see what he said to them just before he said, before he said that. 
just a few verses earlier, about 20 verses earlier, John chapter 6, now verse 35, this was the context. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And this, these were Jewish people primarily listening to him. They have the picture of the Old Testament manna. They, they understand that that was a foreshadowing of the coming Messiah. They're contemplating, is this really the Messiah or should we continue looking elsewhere? And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, never go thirsty. Whoever believes in me, I'm sorry, whoever, whoever comes to me, never go hungry. Whoever believes in me, never be thirsty. <clears throat> Verse 36, but as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. You see, Jesus had already told them that. Um, he'd already, he, before he told them, if you follow me, you'll walk in light, he told them, eat my flesh and drink my blood or have no part of me. Okay? But before that, he told them, I am the bread of life. Like the manna in the wilderness, I am your only hope. Come to me and you'll never go hungry. Believe in me, you'll never go thirsty. Remember the famous, famous verse in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, well, what's, what's with this weird, weird sort of um, description that Jesus paints of eating His flesh and drinking His blood? Well, I think that, I think maybe it's starting to become clear to you. I think it was clear to his disciples that day that what Jesus is saying is this. You can't take an, this, this, like, I'll just nibble, I'll just graze, pick at my food sort of approach to Jesus. I'll just, I'll just snack on Jesus every once in a while. Then I'll go about and do my own thing, and then I'll come back. Jesus is saying, no, you have to fully ingest me into your life. You have, to, you have to take me into your life completely. And, and, and some of us, we're, we're like, we're on the precipice. We're, we're about to that point. And some of us, you know, some of you, you already are at that point. You've already made that step. Some of us were thinking about making that step. Some of us were just on the verge. Maybe you're beginning to understand what Jesus is saying to you. Listen, in the American church, we've gotten used to a very low bar regarding Jesus' expectation of us. And the result is that many churchgoers, and, and some of us here, we're still walking in darkness. Because we think that Jesus calling our life is just a really low bar, easy to step over. I'm just going to call myself a Christian, and, and, and every once in a while I'll, 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 I'll come around the flock, you know, and, and, and I'll... But actually, Jesus, the bar that Jesus sets is a very high bar. To so this cost-benefit analysis, the cost is quite high, but the benefit is Jesus says, on the day of resurrection, I will raise you up to eternal life. So, the next stage of your life, because the past is the past. There's no, there's no, there's no regret. There's no point. Like, looking on the past with, with re regret and guilt, I, I don't think that's from Christ. But looking forward with anticipation and with repentance and with a, with a renewed uh, direction that is what Jesus is calling you to. 
So the next stage of life, moving forward in this, you know, one of the final Sundays in, 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 in 2022. Life for you could just be safe, devoid of risk, maybe moderately prosperous. I mean, many of us in this room, and many just humanity, it's just, it's just human nature. We've set the highest goal in life is to get rid of all risk. Think on that. Is that like maybe your highest aim? I'm just going to... I'm, 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 I'm very risk-averse, and so my goal in life is to get rid of financial risk, physical risk, mental risk, emotional risk. I'm not going to be vulnerable. I'm not going to let anyone in. I'm just going to take care of myself. And we all understand how at times the, the life just hurts too much, and we just that's just what I want at times. But see, that makes Jesus calling our lives to feast on Him difficult, because Jesus' calling in your life is risky. That's why so many people walked to that day. Not because he was being gross, but because he was calling them to great risk. So in the final reading uh, of, for today, Jesus asks a very gutsy question. Don't, don't put it up yet. Jesus has a very gutsy question. I mean, he's already, at that moment in his ministry, he's already driven so many people away. Why would he invite more people to walk away? Like, he's going to lose his whole crowd if he's not careful. All right, John 6, verse 67. Jesus says, You do not want to leave too. Do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, in some translations say, you alone have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen. So Jesus asks that, but he asks us today as well. He says, do you want to wander? Do you want to go away? I, I, every year I see, I see this, those who wander... Um, I mean, a few of them maybe because like, they don't like me or they got some beef with me. But, but usually, usually they, they, they walk away because they determine that following Jesus is just too difficult. You know, we preach, we preach a sermon on, uh, on generosity in, in your pocketbook and some leave because it's just too hard. And, and you, you, you preach a sermon on on community and connection and, and some leave because it's too hard. And we preach, preach a sermon on how the, the gospel trumps politics. And people leave because it's too hard. And, and Jesus gave them permission to leave. But, but, but Peter doesn't leave because he says, where would I go? My, my life would just go nowhere. No one else holds the the keys to the kingdom. No one else holds eternal life. You alone have eternal life. And that's the one reason that we, at the end of 2022, that we don't wander. Many of you have been following Jesus, truly, truly following Jesus for decades now. And if you're like me, I mean, the reason that I haven't stopped following Jesus. Is it because I'm like I'm super faithful and I'm an awesome dude and he picked the right guy when he picked me? No, it's actually because there's nowhere else to go. In, in, in my ethic, I don't know where else I would go. No, no one else holds eternal life. That's why I don't wander. It, the promise has always been For those of us walking in darkness 
And the antidote has always been the shining of a great light. So in my Tuesday morning cost-benefit analysis that I was doing, this is where I landed. Nowhere else to go. No one else offers eternal life. So Jesus, he calls you today. <clears throat> he calls us today to, to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Not, not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. So if you're listening, if you're still with me, if you're still tracking, as you do your own cost benefit analysis. Um, following Jesus for, for, for maybe every one of us is going to cost us a lot. If you're like me, some of you are, my life over the last few years as I've gotten a little bit older, it's get, gotten a little bit easier. I mean, I, I, tell, I, I see people with young babies and strollers being pushed around and people just starting their careers and people trying to find a job. And I want to help you and I say, you know what? If you just keep on working hard, life does get easier. And that is true in a sense. It's certainly true for me. At, at 53, most of my kids are almost or on their way out of the house. In some ways, life has gotten easier and frankly, that's got me to thinking, like, is that a good thing? If I just spend the next 30 years being super comfortable, what if Jesus calls me to something hard? Would I be willing? Would I be obedient? Or do I love my comfort more than anything? So I'm considering what... What does it really mean to feast on Jesus? Not just nibble, not just graze, not just snack, but fully ingest Jesus. And so I'm going to close with this. I think that it means that I'm going to be less comfortable, less lazy in the next stage of my life. What does it mean for you? I think for some of you it might mean you'll be it's going to sound radical, but for some of you, it means that you're going to, you're going to go out in the missionary field. For some, it means you're going to be opening up your home, opening up your life, letting church groups into your home, maybe even sometimes strangers into your home because that's what Jesus, I don't know, but that's what Jesus maybe for some of you is going to call you to. For some, it means that you're going to give, give away uh, money, assets, things of value. Give it away to the cause of Christ. For some of you, maybe it means that you're going to adopt. For some of us, and this, this hits home with me, for some of us, it's going to mean rather than working for retirement, it means that God's going to call us to to work for, for some other amazing dream that he's going to give you, that he's going to give me. This means not fading off into retirement and fading off into grandparenthood, but rather a new, exciting assignment from God. For a few of you, and I don't say this um, in a trite fashion, for a few of you, maybe it means that you're going to go somewhere and plant a church yourself. For most of you, though, it's going to mean that you're going to be a bold, gospel-proclaiming Christian in the job you already have, in, in the community you already live in, 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 in the neighborhood that you already love. John chapter 1, and then we're going to go to the table of communion. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, 
but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Oh, may that be true in your life and in mine. May we receive him. May we believe in his name that we might be given the right to be called children of God, sons and daughters of the living God. Amen. Would you bow with me?